All right. All right. So I don't hear anybody shouting, saying that they they uh, don't have the slides. So since the screen share is not working. All right. So I'm just going to start with uh, slide three is the title is Attention Sinks Overview. All right. And so by now you probably have figured out the problem is that if you train your model on a fixed window size like 4,000, by the time you get past that, say you're, you're on the 5,000th token, um, if you're caching keys and values, which people do for performance, then the model go, does really, really poorly after 4,000. It doesn't even generate coherent sentences anymore. Um, and people were trying to figure out, well, how can we have something like a chat bot and not have to have the chat end after the 4,000? excuse me, the 4,000th token, and to not have to pay the performance penalty of recalculating all the keys and values um, every time. So they did some experiments, okay? And um, there was this heavy hitter paper that showed that some tokens get a lot of attention, um, but they weren't really sure which ones. And ultimately, what we're going to see is they found out that the first token, or maybe sometimes the first few tokens, were getting a lot of the attention and so instead of a naive sliding window where you use the 4,000 most recent tokens, you keep a couple of the first few tokens, the very first ever tokens. And then you do, say, the 3,995 most recent tokens. And that solves the problem. So that's the, the overview. I'll just, I'll just go through a little bit of the, the uh, figures and stuff. So uh, next is... Um, Slide four, long context approaches. And so the idea here is that with a regular, what I talked about, with a regular sliding window, you do KV caching, has real problems. Perplexity, um, if you guys uh, are looking at the figure at the bottom, uh, it's this like log scale for uh, the probability, how likely the, the, the uh, tokens that are in the test set um, how likely they were in uh, what the model was actually trying to output. So if your model, you know, uh, was 100% certain and it had the right token, then you get a very, very low perplexity. Normally, you know, perplexity like two to five, something is like pretty good. And so you can see that um, <clears throat> when you use naive Windows attention, the perplexity jumps to 5,000. It's a really, really terrible perplexity score. Okay. Um, and we'll get to it, but the attention sink basically says include in your sliding window the 3,995 plus the first one or the first, you know, four or something like that. Um, all right, going on to slide five. Um, so why the sliding windows uh, performance is impacted. You see the diagram at the bottom, um, some attention patterns. And so this basically says, hey, we're looking at tokens from left to right. Okay, and we're looking at the layers of the model, uh, in this case, from top to bottom. It's confusing. Some papers will put layer zero at the bottom of the diagram. Other papers, like this one, put layer zero at the top. So you always have to look at each one uh, to make sure what you're looking at. And so especially if you look at something like um, this third big diagram, layer two, uh, the first attention head, uh, this dark red color shows that it is paying attention to the, the the very first token, the zeroth token, almost all the time. It's super, super heavy. And then in these small little thumbnails, you can see a lot of red on this zeroth token as well. And so they're saying that for some reason, this model wants to attend to the zeroth token. But when you don't give it anymore, when the window starts to slide, now the earliest token it sees is, let's say, the fifth token. And that first one's not there. And the difference between the zeroth token and the fifth token causes this model to just completely uh, go haywire. So like, oh, well, maybe we can solve this by just like never taking away the zeroth token. And in fact, that's, that's uh, what does work. So uh, slide six, attention sinks. They did that. Um, um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so what is perplexity? Yeah, perplexity... Um, it's it's kind of a confusing thing, but it's a it's like a, a a log version of the probability that you assigned 
to the word that was the correct word in the test set. So if the real sentence was, the boy threw the ball to John, okay? So then you put in the, and then the model says, what was the probability that you had for the word boy? And at this point, like after the, like you probably don't really know. And so like the probability might've been only 1%, okay? Okay. I was like, the boy, what's the probability you had for the word through? Oh, 10%. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, you were pretty confident, right? Um, um, the, and then, you know, ball, let's just say you had like 50%. Well, now you're going to get a really good score because you were very confident that the wall, the, the next word was was ball. Okay. Okay. And okay. so it's just progressively looking at each word and saying, uh, um, so it's not scoring the word that the model actually predicted. It's scoring the word it should have predicted to see how far down on the probabilities it is. Okay. Okay. And so it's it, and it's sort of like an inverse thing. So the lower your probability, the bigger the perplexity is going to be. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And then you 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 sort of combine this over the all the words. It's not it's not reported on a single word. Okay. Uh, so, but the bottom line is that low perplexities are good and, and high perplexities are bad. So I'm now on slide six, the one titled attention sinks. Um, so they did some experiments. They found, they tried different LLMs. Okay. Um, I don't remember exactly which ones were in the paper. And they said, yeah, sometimes one token's pretty good. Really at most keeping four tokens is enough. Um, and then uh, getting into the technicalities of things, you have positional impeddings in these GPT-style LLMs. And so what they said is, if you're on the 5,000th token, you can't use tokens 0, 1, 2, 3, and then jump up to 1,004, 1,005, and have this like giant hole in the, in the numbering. Uh, because the models, again, are not expecting positions up to 5,000. So they say, just number everything zero to 4,000, just like you normally do. Okay, just the fact that you have this like hole in there, just just pretend that like it's not there. Just stitch them together and just treat everything's normal. And you're allowed to do caching of your keys and values. And the the model um, will will output data quite reasonably. Hmm. Yeah, uh, just so people know... Um, it took me years before I understood what the heck perplexity was. And my biggest challenge was that I thought perplexity was measuring the word that was predicted. And once I saw that, no, it was actually measuring the word it should have predicted, then it was a lot easier for me to figure out what perplexity means. Because then you just see, like, oh, okay, there'll be a penalty if the, the word that was actually in the text in your test set had a very, very low probability. That's when you get penalized. All right, so moving on now to slide seven, um, they said, uh, again, they were really focused on this whole streaming idea. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this second paper, which is really focusing on the attention sinks, but they were focused on the streaming. And so what they said is, if the models really like this idea of knowing what the first token is, what if we just have a special token that is called the beginning of everything always i'm always token number zero and what they found is that if they try to model from scratch such that there was always this special token it didn't get used anywhere else so it's not gonna it's not gonna have its meaning collapsed with um the meaning of the word boy or the meaning of the word you know um throw right uh and they found that yes the models were really happy you only needed one token at the beginning you don't need four or whatever uh and the models would do the same thing that they normally do, where they give a lot of attention to that first token. Uh, but the models just seem like very, very happy, and they never really needed more than one attention sink in order to uh, sort of happily do this. And then they could do their streaming trick, where they just have that first token, and then the three thousand nine hundred ninety-nine uh, most recent tokens, and. Pretty good performance. Now, obviously, again, you're going to have they're, they're testing mostly just like the coherency of the language. So, whether or not the model like perfectly remembered everything you talked about in the last three thousand nine hundred tokens, and whether you know you asked it a question, it did that. Like that's that's a much harder question. But at least they solved the problem where 
it used to be at 4001, the model would suddenly stop knowing how to make complete sentences, you know? So like, that's, that's the main accomplishment of this paper. All right. Um, so then in conclusion, slide eight, um, they, they use these attention sinks and it solved the, the big problem they had. It allows them to use caching, which is very, very important for speeding up inference. And there's really like no downside to this because like you're allocating just a few tokens. Mm -hmm. And if you do the pre-training trick, you're allocating only one token. So people, since this paper, have really come up with ways to expand the fixed window size. So now you're seeing 60, 16,000, 32,000, 64,000, 100,000. It's not as bad as it used to be, but it's still like a convenient thing to know that if you go past that, if you use this trick, then um, then you're good. All right. Ted, can, so that was can, the first you, paper. can you revisit that just for a sec? When you mean they expanded the window size, they're just saying the window size where it started losing its mind or whatever, or no, just just in terms of training. So from scratch, these mm -hmm. more recent models are trained. You know, there's now a GPT four that was trained on I think 128 thousand length contexts. So oh. it cost them more money to train it on a bigger context than if uh -huh. they had just trained it on 32 thousand. So it's more expensive for you to use GPT-4 length 128,000 mm -hmm. than to use the GPT-4 length 32,000. You know, maybe it costs you twice as much to, to mm -hmm. use that version. But people are at least making it work, and there's other things we're not going to talk about today with, um, you know, different embeddings and, and, and whatever, right? Um, but so it's not as painful because you're not as likely to run out of the window length as when it used to be just 1,000 or 4,000. You know, right. you can run out of that pretty quickly. Um, so it's not as bad of a problem, but still go long enough and you're going to run into that problem. Hmm. Okay. Uh, do you know why they, why the performance, why you, when using a special token, they were able to get by with just one rather than one to four? I think the yeah, I think the main reason is because in the second paper we're actually going to see what is going on with with this attention sink, okay? And by having a unique token that's n that that doesn't have to do any other work, um, you don't have this this uh, I'm not thinking of the word I want to use, but this collision between. So let's say the first word is the. That's a fairly reasonable like first word, right? Um, the has to do two things now. The has to mean the, and the also has to do this special duty as the zero token that that mm -hmm. acts as an attention sink. And so, you know, you have to sort of hedge a little bit because you can't just whatever that mechanism is, you can't just put all of the focus on the because then the doesn't get to do what the is supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. But when you have this nonsense token that's only used just as an anchor in that first spot then it has no other function it doesn't have to have any semantic meaning and you can just uh, use it for the purpose of this mm, that makes sense also do you know what uh you, you said the word you said streaming trick or something earlier what um did, what, what did you mean by that so so they called this streaming llm basically what they just mean is you have a chat bot and it's just going on infinitely, and it's not going to stop at 4,000. And okay. so so then the trick they're doing is they're using the most recent 3,900 plus the attention sink. And so that allows them, hypothetically, to go on infinitely. Again, it's debatable whether or not you, as, a, as someone chatting with this chatbot, would find the performance satisfactory, because it's not going to remember things that you said a long time ago. It's mm -hmm. only going to remember things that you said in the last... 3,900 tokens, but it's a lot better than if it just devolves into like gibberish and can't make complete sentences. Mm -hmm. And that's a window that they can make bigger over time, I, or they are making bigger over time, right? So, Yes, ju just by finding tricks to reduce the cost so that they can train bigger and bigger ones, but ultimately it costs you more to train on a bigger window. Right, okay. All right, so... Um, so I'll just briefly say, uh, uh, basically, when this phenomenon came out, 
uh, people had theories, and the main theory is that uh, in the attention mechanism, we're not going to go deep into the attention mechanism, but basically uh, you have the, the most current word, and it does a query, and then it looks at all the words uh, to its left, including itself, and it calculates a key for all of those. And what it's going to do is it's going to compare the queries to the keys, and it's going to run it through the softmax function. And the softmax function is going to essentially give you a probability. The attention scores all have to sum to one. Okay. And so what people what people hypothesized is that well, what if you don't want to pay attention to anything? You know, sometimes you could say like the word he or whatever, and so you you want that to pay attention to the word that came before it that he is referencing. Oh, he's pointing to like John. I said John before or um, whatever. Uh, or you might have a phenomenon where you uh, have a, a verb uh, and it's like walk and you have to look at the subject to know, should I say walk or walks? Is Am I talking about a singular or a plural subject? So there's reasons why you would want to have to pay attention to you know words that came before you. But what happens when you don't want to pay attention to anything? The softmax function must sum to one. You have to pay attention to something. And so the, the hypothesis is that somehow the model figured out a way that when I'm paying attention to a token zero, that we can just sort of ignore that. Okay. And somehow it has to know the difference between when I really want to pay attention to token zero and when I'm just like using this as the default. So what we're going to see in this next paper that just came out is that's in fact, ex well, I don't know if we really proved that that's exactly right, but based on that, uh, the exact mechanism for how it pays attention to token zero um, has been discovered. So um, there are some references on slide nine, uh, some of the other uh, uh, papers that were sort of uh, topics that were mentioned in the slides. So then slide 10 introduces our new paper. So this one just came out um, and it's called Spectral Filters, Dark Signals and Attention Sinks. Uh, the author makes up uh, some of this terminology, the spectral filters and the dark signals. And we'll see a little bit about what they're talking about. So the overview is on slide 11, okay. Um, and so in this paper, they just looked at one family of models, LAMA2, they looked at the three sizes, the 7 billion, 13 billion, and 70 billion sizes. And they're going to use this technique from linear algebra. They're going to look at the singular value decomposition of both the embedding and the unembedding matrices. And I'll give a little bit of background on this for people who, who um, uh, don't remember uh, or haven't done their, their linear algebra. And... If you're familiar with principal components analysis, PCA, sometimes mm -hmm. do people do PCA to reduce dimensionality or to do a visualization to say, drop it down to like 2D so I can do a chart on paper. Um, but what they looked at was instead of the biggest singular values, uh, they looked at the smallest ones because the reason why we look at, at the biggest ones when we do visualizations is we say, let's look at the most important directions in our data. OK, mm -hmm. but they're saying, hey, maybe the model is the, the model's main job is to predict the next token. But if I want to to like store some information that I don't want to muddy up my prediction, maybe what I should do is I should store it in these directions are the least important <laughs> for predicting uh, the outcome. So that was sort of the hypothesis why the research started looking at the low end, the end that we're usually throwing away, because they're saying, yeah, maybe the model actually wants to be able to hide information at this low end, and it'll get thrown away, and it won't mess up my next token prediction, but I can use it for like intermediate values or something like that. And it turns out that's not what the, the, the author thought it was going to be, but it turned out that at least one of the things it does there is it stores attention sink information. Um, and so ultimately, they were able to show that that these, hey, what he called Ted? dark signals at the far end, um, are implementing attention sinks. Yeah. Is it storing it? Is the model making that decision or is the implementer of the model making that decision? Now, during training, the model very much has to come up with 
techniques, you know, it, I mean, we're just doing back propagation and now we're trying to figure out what, what, what sort of algorithm is the model implementing in all those ways, right? And so we're finding out that in fact, it has implemented this algorithm. That's interesting. So it has a natural tendency to do this, this uh, feature of storing this information. Yeah. And, over and, in this area. and obviously not all GPT style decoder only models are identical, but as far as I know, every model we've tested um, has this phenomenon. And there's certain other phenomenon that they all they all share in common. So it seems to be that for something complex like language modeling, there's some basic things that are very handy. And all right. A, so this is just the overview. This is where we're gonna go. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let, let so me, so we haven't actually it. I don't expect you to understand it yet. I haven't explained it. Okay. But what we're gonna see is that this this low end is is where information gets stored and then ultimately um, it can use that information. Uh, so there's a question in the chat. Does token zero act like a seed value in a random number generator? Um, if you change the seed, you change the sequence. Um, so it's it's a little bit more like token zero acts as white noise. So if you're in a room that has a certain amount of white noise, after a little while, you just tend to like stop noticing it. It just becomes the background. Okay. And so ultimately, uh, the model's kind of using... Uh, token zero as this like no information background so if you see that it just doesn't it just doesn't do anything with it and, and we'll get into some more of the details all right so how we do on time uh pretty good so attention 12 uh, <laughs> slide 12 so before we get into the rest of the paper um i have some slides here this is this content on the next few slides is not in the paper this is background material to make sure people understand uh llms and understand a little bit of the the linear algebra okay so uh the next few slides we're going to start with the attention diagram if you guys have seen it the transformer diagram mm -hmm. and uh we're going to show how that looks explicitly uh drawn out in an LM because normally people like show the attention diagram and they're like, imagine an LM. And it's like, well, are you imagining the same thing I'm imagining? Cause maybe, maybe we are, maybe <laughs> we're not. Okay. Um, the other thing that we're going to talk about is that this idea of the residual stream. So let's say your residual stream is, is, is 512 floats. Um, people are thinking about this as a 512 dimensional vector space. And so we'll talk a little bit about like what exactly that means. Um, and so uh, there's a, a logit lens. It's actually not a paper. It's a it's a blog post um, where they tested basically like okay, so let's say you have a model that has 24 layers, and after the the last layer, you unembed and you you see out of your vocabulary of 30,000 words, which one's the most likely. Well, do we have to wait till the 24th layer? What if we did it halfway after the 12th layer? What if we did it after the sixth layer? And what they found is that there are like pretty coherent um, answers um, fairly early. Maybe not at like the first, the second layer, but you know, like um, from like whatever, like 10% into the, the model up until, you know, the very end, you get, you get these very coherent answers. For some words, it'll get the right word super early. Um, and for others, you'll see it'll be some other word, and then over time, that word will change, and a different word will become the most likely word. Um, but it's this idea of the the residual stream, which we'll see in the diagrams, as being this place where there's information, and then you're just sort of like, like imagine like clay, you're just sort of shifting it, molding it a little bit to push it in the direction of uh, the word that you eventually want to be outputting next. Um, and then I have another note here, uh, which I think I'm not going to go into. But, um, uh, but if you if you if you read the literature, then then people say, hey, it's not technically um, a vector space because we think that like a vector space has this idea of a zero, and that the residual stream might be kind of like moving, so that it has um, hmm. this offset from zero. And uh, in this paper that we're we're going to look at, they didn't actually try to take that into account and adjust for this potential offset. Okay, so uh, slide 13. 
So if you have uh, could, could you read the could you read the title of the slide? I'm just want to make sure I'm staying oh, safe yeah. here. Yeah. So bases, rotations, and projections. Um, so if you have a 512 floats, basically what people think of that as is a a 512 dimensional space. Now, like for most mortals, you we can think about 2D and maybe 3D. I can't even think about 4D. It's just too difficult. My my head hurts. Okay. Uh, but but we live inside of sort of 2D on paper and 3D when we walk around in the real world. So normally for these abstractions, we just talk about them in low dimensional space. Okay. Um, but so you can imagine that like if you have a chart on paper and you have two axes, um, like a common one that shows up for me at work is one dimension, say the X axis is how much value do I think this project will provide? And it could be small and it could be big. And then the y-axis might be how costly is this project going to be to do, okay? And we have cheap projects and we have, you know, expensive projects. And so everybody's favorite is the projects that are inexpensive um, and high value, all right? And so you can imagine that if you have sort of a graph and you have both positive and negative numbers, then that's a certain direction. Maybe that's like the lower right. So that's, that's pointing southeast, as it were. Okay, and then maybe high value projects, but that are also expensive. That's like the northeast direction. Okay, and then you have uh, low value projects that are expensive northwest. That's the projects everybody wants to kill. And then they this really debatable one is um, on the lower left is is low value, low cost. It's like a quick win. Uh, should we do it? Should we not do it? Uh, you know. But so if you think about this idea of directions have certain meaning. And so I, and the way I'm saying it, it's sort of like east is high value, west is low value, okay? North is high cost, south is low cost. Um, then basically that's the idea, you have this vector space and every point on it has meaning and moving around um, it, on the plane has sort of the same meaning. So no matter where you start, if you move northward, if you move up a certain amount, that's sort of like, oh, same value, but more expensive project. So no matter where, what project you start with, this becomes a less valuable project because you started somewhere and you just moved straight north. So the idea of north like has meaning. Now, it's a little bit more complicated when you're in 512 dimensions because now you have way more things than just two things you're keeping track of, but it's the same, same concept where every direction has a certain meaning and things can be more north and more east, or they could be more north and less east, just like a project could be more north and less east, okay? So that's what people mean when they talk about uh, thinking about things as a vector space. And then vector spaces are linear, so it just means that all the relationships are linear. And so like for any point moving north, you know, one unit sort of means roughly the same thing. Um, that's kind of intuitive when you think about like our 3D world, like moving up one foot means sort of the same thing everywhere. But if it weren't a vector space, it could be something weird where like in one place moving up a foot means it costs a dollar more and a different place moving up a foot means it costs a million dollars more. Okay. And that's not true in vector spaces. Vector spaces are linear. So, we can think about this this concept, but the problem with looking at the, the 512 floating point values that come out of a particular model is this idea that we have these bases, okay? And so I was talking about like north and east as being my basis for my project, 2D vector space, okay? But in the world of linear algebra, all bases are created equal. And so if you look at the bottom of slide 12, uh, sorry, slide 13 on the left, you can see we have sort of the black lines that represent the normal way we think of the X and the Y axis as being X axis being east, west, and the, the Y axis being north, south. But what you can see on there are these blue lines that are rotated slightly counterclockwise, okay? In the world of linear algebra, if one of those blue lines meant how valuable a project is, and the other blue line meant how expensive it is, 
even though they're rotated, it would work perfectly well. It would work identically well to the one that's oriented the way we think about it. Okay. And the problem for us is that if there's no way to force it to be sort of the, the, I don't want to say the intuitive X and Y axes that we're used to, then when you see a particular number, like, like I, you know, what I'm looking for is like, oh, the, the, the point that's like quintessentially East is the point that's like one comma zero. So it's got a lot of East and it's got no North South. So like, what does that point mean? The problem is if the basis is the blue ones, then the point that's like quintessentially, you know, um, on the on the quote unquote blue x axis, it's going to have a non zero value for both x and y. All right, and then this just gets even more complicated when you're in five hundred twelve direction dimensions because there's five hundred eleven degrees of freedom to rotate this thing around. Okay, so what what as researchers the problem you have is that a point that is just pure east and nothing else is not going to have zeros. It's just going to have floating point values in all 512 floats because it's rotated and you don't know. So when you just look at two points and you see the numbers, you can't know if one of them is like right on one of the axes or not um, because you have to figure out what this basis is. What are the 512 floats for? Uh, so that's just more ability for the for the model to store information. Okay, so in a language model, normally you say you have a vocabulary of 30,000. There's 30,000 unique tokens. These days we tend to use like subword, you know, mappings and things. So super common words like the and maybe, you know, boy or whatever, those will get their own tokens. Um, but then if you have some very complicated word like um, eclipse, uh, maybe that's not that's not its own token, and so maybe that needs to get broken up into the letter E, and then clip, and then S, and then E, and so it's actually four tokens. All right. Um, so you're going to store each of those tokens as a as a, a dense piece of information, and so this is predetermined based on the model architecture. So I'm saying 512 floating point numbers. So when you train the model, you know each each token gets its representation. And As in the tokens represented in 512 floating numbers? Yeah, so every token okay. gets gets us, it says, boy, okay, use these 512 floats. Got it. Girl, use these 512. And so oftentimes you will see certain patterns that 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 hint at this idea of a vector space because you might say like, wow, if I subtract boy from girl, and I subtract man from woman, I wind up with sort of the same value. And that might be sort of the gender direction in our vector space. Okay. So people mm -hmm. have done stuff where they're like, oh, let's look at the difference between boy and girl, man and woman, king and queen, and a whole bunch of things. And they're like, hey, a lot of them are very similar. Okay. And so then maybe you would say, well, can I compare the direction between like um, capitals? So like Paris and France. And Madrid and Spain, okay, and like, it won't be perfect, but like, yeah, a lot of times you'll find that like that direction between a country and its capital is also very similar for many different countries. So there's this idea that there's meaning in this 512 dimensional vector space, but it's very hard for us to truly understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And because of the rotation problem, it's not as easy as just simply saying, "Well, which po which which." tokens are the closest to one zero 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 and which ones are closest to zero one zero 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 you're right because if they if they were aligned to our coordinate system that's what they would look like but they're not aligned they can just be rotated and mm -hmm. as far as linear algebra is concerned there's absolutely no difference linear algebra could care less the fact that we have a coordinate system that's like <laughs> one zero zero like that mm -hmm. all right um so then finally, uh, you have this idea that <clears throat> if you have a vector x, uh, so in the lower right diagram, and uh, one of your, your blue bases, uh, it's now yellow, uh, is labeled b, what we can do is we can do a projection onto it. Uh, you might have seen this in geometry. This might be a, just a fairly intuitive uh, concept that you basically 
drop this red dotted line um, at right angles, uh, orthogonal uh, to to B. And so then the the more X is very close to the same direction as B, then basically this projection is going to make very little change. Okay. To the extent that X is closer to perpendicular to B, when you drop this down, you're going to get a value close to zero. All right. And so uh, in two dimensions, you can basically do the projection of X onto your first basis, B, your B1, and then you can also project it onto your B2. Okay. And this is the way you can see sort of how much, so to speak, right? How much a given vector um, has of each of the different bases. So again, think about that project, right? How much is it a high value or a low value project? How much is it a high cost or a low cost project? How you could do that is just by taking the point that represents that project and projecting it onto your bases. Now, obviously, if you're building a chart at work, you should use the standard bases, which is the x-axis and the y-axis. But again, mathematically, you could rotate things and the chart would work perfectly fine if it were rotated. Your manager's not going to be happy with you, but the chart means the exact same thing, even if you rotate it 30 degrees counterclockwise. Like it's perfectly interpretable. It just might be super annoying. Okay. So the problem we have is that the model, it's it's not it doesn't know about our preference for this particular thing. And so it just, you know, we're, we're initializing it with random weights. And so it's doing the best it can. It's figuring something out and it's learning these, these, these relationships, but it doesn't know that. Okay, so those are the, the math concepts that we're really gonna need uh, for this paper. So then let's talk about the model itself. So we're gonna go on to slide 14. Um, and slide 14 is the transformer diagram. Uh, you've probably seen pictures of it. Um, it's it's super famous um and i'm not going to go into what exactly everything means inside here okay um we won't have time for that if we go through but what you'll see is that the yellow or orange boxes are the attention parts the blue boxes are the feed forwards the the the, the, the mlps and then you have things at the beginning the pink is where you do embedding so you take a token and you turn it into one of these 512 length you know floats i'm talking about and at the very end the green soft max is the, the 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 linear layer in the soft max this is the unembedding so it takes the 512 floats and it turns it into one of the well it turns it into probabilities for all 30,000 of your vocabulary words and in the simple version you just look at which one's the biggest and then the max one that's the token that you spit out all right um but we're not going to talk about the actual original transformer because GPT-2 style models don't use the whole thing. So if you go to slide uh, uh, 15, I have two big red X's on the parts that aren't used in GPT-2 or 3 or Llama or Vicuna or Mistral or any of these um, decoder only LLMs. So slide 16 shows you what it looks like if you just remove the X'd out parts. And then slide 17, it's the same thing. If you go back and forth between 16 and 17, you'll see those same components, okay? But on slide 16, you have these arrows that sort of loop around the orange and go into the yellow box and loop around the blue and go into the yellow box. And that sort of hides. So this is the residual connection, okay? So if you're familiar with like ResNets, um, but this sort of hides the way that that residual connection is working. And so it's much more intuitive if you look at slide 17 to think about that for the orange box, the attention happens. The normalization, by the way, some, sometimes now it happens before instead of after. But either way, the normalization and the attention happen in some order. And then the output of them gets summed onto whatever your original value was. So if the attention outputs all zeros and the feed forward outputs all zeros, then what happens is the original um, embedding, the 512 floats from your word, just move on up to the next layer unaffected. Okay, so you should, you, mentally you should really think about that as the default operation, is that the attention does nothing, the feed forward does nothing, and then 
um, our 512 floating point values will move on upwards uh, unchanged. And if that happens at all of the layers in our model, then the final next token prediction will be just be based on whatever came out of the pink box at the bottom. That's the default behavior until the model learns to actually change the values that are on here. All right. There may be some questions, but let me see if we can get through the next couple slides and then what, we'll, because they may actually answer some of the thing, things in your head. Um, if, uh, if we need to, we can come back. So slide 18, all that I've done is drawn multiple copies to show you that when you see one diagram, what you should really be thinking about is on the left is token zero, and the next to it is token one, and then three, and then four, and dot, 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 all the way up to potentially, let's say, 4,000 for my model. Okay. Um, if you look at all the orange boxes on slide 18, all of those attentions have identical weights. So when you talk about there's certain parameters in there, there's the the weights you use to calculate the, the, the queries, the weights you use to calculate the keys, those are all identicals, okay? So these are uh, whatever, twins, these are replicas of each other. Everything in the same layer is identical. These are all identical twins, all right? Um, on slide 19, I'm gonna shrink this to make more room because on slide 20, now we're actually gonna show you a real model that has multiple layers, okay? What you'll see is in the multiple layers, the middle parts get copied, the orange and the blue parts, the attention layers and the MLP layers. The pink and the, the, the purple green, they don't get copied, okay? There's only ever one of them at the beginning and one of them at the end. So this is the mental model you should make when you see that very first diagram. But I include this because not everybody has the exact, exact same mental model, all right? So I want to be very explicit about what's the mental model we talk about. Now that we have multiple layers, um, you can imagine starting in the lower left with the first pink box for token zero. Token zero comes in and it's whatever it is, and it gets converted to 512 floats. And then, as I was saying, the orange and the blue boxes in layer zero, the first layer, uh, they can add or subtract values to any one of the 512 positions, and they can modify that word. But if they don't, then it's just going to move on up, and then it's going to go to layer one. And it might get modified a little bit, and then go to layer two, dot, 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 all the way to the last layer. Okay. And then at that point, you don't get to do any more modifications, and it's simply going to do an unembedding, which is the blue-purple box, okay? And it's going to do the soft max to see which is the highest probability. Technically, if you just want the highest probability, you don't even need to do a soft max because whatever the biggest number is, that's the highest one. But soft max means that it'll scale it so that they all add up to one. So you can think of them as probabilities. So on this diagram, the pink boxes are what we call embedding matrices. And the blue purple boxes, I'll call it purple to distinct it to ch so it's not confusing with the light blue. The purple boxes are the unembedding matrices, right? So um, if your vocabulary, as I've been saying, is 30,000 and your model dimension is 512, then the embedding matrix is going to be a 30,000 by 512 matrix. And the unembedding is going to be a 512 by 30,000 matrix. And this vertical line that connects them is what people now call the residual stream, OK? So intuitively, it makes more sense for you to think about this as like a data bus and that the, the orange and the blue uh, boxes are just using some le levers to try and mold the clay a little bit, to try and twist it, push it, nudge it a little bit, okay? The, the reality is the nudge might be a lot. It might be super strong. But my mental model is that the information is flowing through and it's just getting tweaked a little bit as it goes through all these layers. And by the time you go through 24 layers, 48 layers, it actually looks a little bit different. Um, and it's been changed, changed enough that now, instead of just what it started with, it can make a intelligent next token, next word prediction. All right. I know I went through a lot of stuff there, but I just want to pause here and just see uh, what questions they are about 
the transformer and the mental model for, for embedding residual stream on embedding. Um, if a token was not modified by one of the layers, would it? Is there any chance that it would be modified by a, a future layer? Oh yeah, sure, sure. I mean, the, and 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 mostly it will get modified, but but in theory it doesn't. And so, in fact, okay. one of the things people have tested is that out of the pink box, um, basically there is there is dense inf there is information in the pink box. So basically, um, uh, I can't think of. Uh, so, so if, if the word is white, for example, mm -hmm. okay, then it's possible that the pink box has enough information to say house is an extremely likely next word because white house just shows up over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm having trouble thinking of other like really great, like, things that go right together but like mm -hmm. um uh but they've tested four cases so if you have just like a word like the there's so many things that could follow the it's very hard to test c but if you have things that are more rare um mm -hmm. then you get to see like wow like like um yes in that pink box so if it weren't modified basically it's saying your best guess after the word white would be the word house mm -hmm. so it's already known right Based on all the other information you have, then these orange and blue boxes might modify and say, yeah, 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 White House normally is 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 a really great completion, but the person's in the middle of listing a whole bunch of colors. And so I think red or blue would actually be a better next token prediction. Okay, even though they use the same um, attention stuff? Yeah, and I mean, it's a, it's you know, gets very complicated. It's a little bit mysterious, okay, like okay. exactly what all these different layers are doing. But that's the idea is that you have this default behavior. And if you want to keep it fine, but if you don't want to keep it, it's up to you to keep tweaking it at each of the layers to, to massage things, yeah. to turn it from house into blue. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. So this is this is the background for um, for the rest of this paper discussion. Um, and again, at any point, feel free to chime in with with other questions. So, uh, oh, let's see here. Uh, Twenty one uh, has hidden states. We don't necessarily have to talk about these, but again, with this idea of the residual stream, the the, the purple circles, these are the places where you would typically. Uh, read off the values that are sitting there. Um, and then slide 22 shows the fact that when you do attention, attention is actually looking to its left at, at the tokens. If you could, like, it's an eye chart. If you look really, really closely zoomed in, you would see that there are arrows that point only to the right. <laughs> okay. You can't look, you can, the data can't flow to the left. Data can only flow to the right. But so the token that's token number three. It can look at token two, token one, token zero on its left, and um, it's doing that. So uh, the blue boxes, the feed forward layers, cannot do any calculations based on anything other than the current token position. Okay, so they can still say, ah, based on what I see, I'm going to add some values onto the residual stream, but the orange boxes, attention can can do work across token positions and con just so you guys know like the conventional wisdom is that what they're doing is they're copying information uh from uh uh from one token position uh to to another so hold on one sec all right uh so now the actual paper Okay, sorry. Um, one last slide of buildup. This is part of the paper, but um, before we're really getting into the paper itself. So the LAMA 2, 7 billion, 13 billion, and 70 billion, I've been talking about 512, okay? Just so you guys know, there in uh, LAMA 7 billion, LAMA 2, 7 billion has 4,900, 4,096 floats in its residual stream. The 13 billion model has 5,100. 
And the 70 billion version of the model is even bigger. It has 8,192 floats in its residual stream. Okay, so when you see certain charts, you'll see that the 13 billion model, the chart is gonna be about 5,000 across because there are 5,000 floating point numbers in, in that size model. Um, attention, if you guys uh, don't know, it's again, I don't have enough time to uh, go over all of it, but it's gonna calculate queries, keys, and values. And even after it does that, it's gonna project it using um, this output uh, matrix. And the feed forward part, the MLP, they actually use this Swiglue activation thing. So it has three weights. The input goes into, um, it gets multiplied by weight one. It also gets combined with, it's multiplied by weight three. That intermediate value gets multiplied by weight two. If you, if you think about these a little bit, what that means then is that the QKV and the W1 and the W3 are the inputs where the Xs get directly multiplied by them. Okay, the value on the residual stream gets directly multiplied by those matrices to create an intermediate value. The O and the W2 matrices, the intermediate value gets multiplied by them and the output gets added directly to the residual stream. So, um, so mostly in this paper, you're going to see them talk about the O and the W2 matrices because those are the ones that directly write onto the residual stream. But conceptually, we can also talk about the other ones because those are the ones that are reading from the residual stream. There's the attention sink paper, and I don't think this is meant exactly for the reason of that paper, but the LAMA2 um, model has a special beginning of sentence token. So it's not only used for token zero, I believe it's used between every single sentence. So it might appear as like the 20th token after the first sentence and then as the 30th token after the next sentence and so on. Um, but it is a token that otherwise has no semantic meaning and the zeroth token is always BOS. So uh, like we were talking about, this actually uh, eliminates the problem of what if the the first token is you? What if the first token is the? What if the token is whatever? It, it has to do other things. In this case, BOS doesn't need to do much else other than just delineate um, zeroth position. So those are the preliminaries around the LAMA2 model. And so now we're ready to dig into slide 24. So slide 24, uh, singular value decomposition. If you don't know singular value decomposition, um, it's it's uh, it's 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 a, it's a very useful tool. It's an interesting topic. Uh, I don't really have enough time remaining today to explain it, but basically, um, what you can do is you can take any matrix, so any of our these weight matrices that we're ta we're talking about, um, and you can break it into three components. Okay, um, it's going to have a left matrix that they typically call U. It's going to have a right matrix that they typically call V. And it's going to have an intermediate diagonal matrix that has what they call singular values. And the really neat thing about this SVD decomposition is that basically it gives you these two bases. And in the middle is a scaling factor. And so the ones with the biggest scaling factor, it means that if you multiply some vector by this matrix, if it's in the direction where there's a big scaling factor, then the output is going to be a lot bigger. If it's in the direction of uh, one of the small singular values, then the output's going to be really small. So in the extreme, if you have a singular value of 10 and you multiply it by a, a, a vector that's in that direction, you're going to get something that's basically approximately the same vector, but 10 times bigger. If you have a singular value that's 0 0.0001 <laughs> and you multiply it by that vector that's in that direction, you're basically going to get zero. You're going to get a vector in the direction, but it's going to be very, very, very tiny. Okay. So again, this is why I was saying earlier that in, in PCA, you usually just look at a few of the biggest ones because they're the biggest contributor to what this matrix does. Uh, the author said, what if I look at the smallest 5% because these are the ones where you might be able to hide things and people won't notice them because they're so small. All right. Um, 
So that's what they they were looking at. And so slide 25 says, let's see if plausibly anything is happening with this last 5%. So if I multiply a vector by our WO or W2 matrix, so these are the ones that are writing to the residual stream. It's really, really hard to see, so I created these yellow ovals. But if you look really closely at the paper or at my slide, you'll see there's a bunch of blue dots that go way up to the top. It's very hard to see, okay, because there's not that many of them. But the, the yellow oval is not bigger than necessary. There is a blue point that is at the very top of each of those yellow ovals if you, if you look closely, okay? And so what this is showing is that, in fact, these matrices are writing and they're writing large values um, in these directions that you would think may not be that useful because because um, because normally what whatever gets output there is pretty small. So this is just the first test. The first test to see are these these blue and orange attention and MLP boxes are they capable of writing to these directions? Because remember, so the, the the point of the singular value is it'll give you a rotated basis. So we talked about like the blue one, you know, like you don't know, but it might be rotated. So it defines a particular basis, a particular rotation. Okay, so they're saying in this rotation, if those are the true northeast, you know, cardinal directions of my model, then let's measure the activity in those directions. And so it's okay, step one, the model's capable of writing those directions. It doesn't just ignore them. Okay, that's pretty good. What's the next thing we need to look at? Slide 26. Let's build something that we're going to call a spectral filter, okay? And uh, if you don't know the linear algebra, that's fine. But basically, if you take some of these, these vectors from, from the singular vectors from the V matrix, okay? You don't have to take all of them. You can take just, say, the last 5%. Then you can do this, this matrix multiply V times V transpose, and it'll give you a matrix and what that will do is that'll do the projection that we talked about earlier, okay? So projecting onto a particular uh, 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 vector. In this case, it's projecting it onto uh, a basis of multiple vectors all at once. It's, uh, it's doing all of them at once instead of just one at a time. But the idea here is, again, you're measuring how much is this, uh, is this vector in the direction of this th these vectors versus... If they're not, you're going to wind up with a bunch of zeros. Okay. And so the idea is once you project onto a set of vectors, if you're left with a large quantity, that means that what you started with is in the direction of those vectors. If what you wind up with is zeros, that means that it was not pointing in that direction. Okay. So that's the idea of a spectra filter. And you see on the lower right diagram, there's two places ultimately where, where the author tested this coming out of the MLP, that orange box, they're, they're going to test to see what's going on there. And then what we've been talking about, this residual stream, they're going to look um, coming out of a particular layer, uh, what happens if I do filtering. So if you're familiar with any other kind of filtering, so like in um, electrical engineering signals, you can, this would basically be kind of like a, a notch filter where, um, uh, uh, you know, you're going to let just certain bands through, and you're going to you're going to filter out the others. Okay, uh, and so what they're showing is we can we can construct a filter to do anything we want. We can pick which bands we want to let through, which ones we don't. And in this case, he's saying I'm specifically going to construct them so that uh, this basis that we we found by using the singular value decomposition, um, uh, I'm going to pick portions on the big end at the small end and I'm going to do some very special tests to see how much do they contribute to the activity and in particular if I like filter out a certain part of it is that going to cause the LLM to start behaving badly poorly right if I do that and it starts behave going haywire then that means that the thing I filtered out was important if I filter something out and nothing seems to change then it was very unimportant for the for the model um, are these, is the basis that the researchers pick, will that affect um, the activity in the uh, direction? Yeah, so primarily the basis 
uh, not every place, but primarily the basis that that you're going to that the author's using is for that unembedding purple matrix. OK, because the unembedding is the one that specifically is used to pick the next token. OK, mm -hmm. and so what they're saying is that the biggest singular values are clearly very important for picking the next token. But gosh, that last five percent are the smallest, least contributors to predicting the next token. So if you wanted to hide any information but not mess up your next token prediction, that's where you would hide it. So that's why he, that's why they went looking there is because this is the place where if you had to hide something that you hope nobody notices when they were picking the next token, that's where you would stop it. Okay. Okay. So when you see on this slide it says WU, that's the that's the matrix associated with the purple box. WE is the embedding matrix associated with the pink box. So mostly in future slides, what you're going to see is we're going to build filters and I'm going to have a little subscript U because they're based on the, 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 the singular values and the rotation associated with WU. Okay. So basically what you can think is there's a rotation defined by WU and based on that, if you pick something that's aligned with one of the big singular values, you're going to get a really large number out, which means a high probability for that token. If you pick one of the really small ones, it's going to have very little contribution to um, to your output. And so, again, the idea is let's let's actually inspect the areas that other people are going to research how you predict the next token. OK, in this case, they wanted to do the opposite. They want to say, let me see if I can find what the model's doing behind the scenes other than predicting the next token. In this case, it's the attention sinks. OK, the attention sinks do not predict the next token. They're just an internal mechanism used for something else. So the I, rotation, I mm -hmm. the rotation is something that they can determine based on the unembedding. Yes. So the unembedding okay. matrix implies a particular rotation that it's looking at. Okay. Got it. So the directions that have big singular values, that's the directions it's looking at. And the directions with small singular values are the directions that are very unimportant to it. And if all directions were equal, you could. You could have one where the singular values are just sort of flat and they're like like all equal everywhere. And in fact, the one that the the, the that slide that showed the singular values. It is relatively flat. There are other phenomena that have much, much smaller uh, singular values at the ten at tail end. Okay, so this this one basically, the unembedding matrix has this ginormous first singular value, and it's very flat. Most of the time, if you just pick a random matrix, it's not going to look like that. It's actually going to fall off, and the last singular values might be close to zero. But in this case, it maintains fairly flat the whole way. All right, so um, so now what they did is they looked at the output coming from the MLPs, and we're going to talk about MLP number three. That's what's in the diagram, okay? At layer three, there is this um, uh, uh, really, really large signal uh, in that last 5%, so what the author is calling the dark signals, okay? He's saying it's dark because... To the, to the next token prediction, it's kind of dark. It doesn't really contribute to it, okay? It doesn't really interact with it. Um, so in the diagram on the right, uh, there's, there's like 20 odd points because he did increments of 5%, okay? And it says, what is our, um, what is our log loss? What is our perplexity? Uh, basically, high is bad and low is good, okay? And so on these curves, what you see is the numbers are all fairly high. And for the red and the green, which corresponds to um, looking at the, the directions of the embedding and unembedding matrices, it stays high all the way up through 95%. And it's only in that very last step when you get to 100% um, that it drops low. So what this is saying is that if I keep the biggest values from from this singular value decomposition. If I keep the biggest ones, the biggest five percent, I get lousy performance. The biggest ten percent, the biggest the biggest ninety five percent, 
I still get lousy performance. It's only when I include that last part, I include 100%, then the model acts normally and has decent performance. So it's not proving what's happening. All he's proving is I can break this LLM by including 95% of things, not that last 5%. I will break the model. So all, all we've done so far at slide 27 is we've proved that the last 5% is important. Most of the time when you do applications, you would say most of the tail end is not important. But in this case, he said, I'm onto something. The last 5% is doing something important. The model stinks if I don't include that. So let's do some more research. Uh, slide 28. Um, uh, that was the output of the MLP. Now let me look at the residual stream. This chart's a little bit hard to read. But again, it's the zero to one hundred percent in twenty in five percent increments across the x-axis, okay, and the the vertical, the y-axis. These are the different layers of the model. So it looks like this model has about forty layers, okay. So if you mess things up early on, it's going to tend to be more catastrophic for the model because, uh, um, you know, you've really screwed things up. Whereas if you do an intervention later on, then the model might not really care because it's already pretty much already figured out what the next token is. And if you, if you just, you know, uh, ch harm its ability to update the residual stream, it might not care because the residual stream already has the right next word token predicted. Okay. And so if you're familiar with Python and Matplotlib, then dark blue purple is close to zero and yellow is a, uh, a, uh, uh, is the big numbers okay and so this is this is showing uh the loss function and so you want it to be low you want it to be blue you would prefer this entire rectangle be solid dark blue okay so every place where you see green or yellow it means that something screwed up the model and it's not working right and in particular if you look at the um three charts other than the first one the two middle ones and the right one what you'll see is there tends to be a fairly dramatic drop, a fairly dramatic improvement where it goes from green to dark blue when you include that last 5%. So it's the same thing as the last slide. We're just saying like, yeah, this model gets really messed up when you filter stuff out if you filter until you include that last 5%. The one on the left is just filtering out random chunks. And so you can see random does harm the model but it doesn't harm it in the same way that those other ones do that it, you know, yeah, of course filtering stuff out is going to hurt the model, but it does pretty well with the last 10%, the last 15%, you know, whatever by my eye, the last 20% is usually pretty decent. Okay. Whereas you have this dramatic phenomenon that when you're filtering, we really need that last 5%. So this is, so this is just further proof that the, um, this last 5%, when you do, you know, those directions, those those directions in our rotated basis are super important. But we need to figure out, like, exactly what. And so slide 29, we say, okay, we know that, we know that the last 5% is important, but why? So let's connect this to attention sinks. What we see is that only for token 0, at layer 3, this giant value gets written to the residual stream. And if you look at the direction, um, uh, the top chart shows that the total length of the vector is blue and the contribution from this last 5% of the basis is the orange. And then the other 95% is the green. So what is being written at layer three is almost entirely, almost exclusively in the direction of this last 5%, the dark basis. And so essentially what we fast forward a little bit to you know, get to the end of the paper, basically uh, token zero at layer three is writing, hey, I'm an attention sink. And it's, it's writing it in the, the directions that are represented in that last 5%, okay? Every layer after, attention, after layer three is going to be able to point to that and say, um, I want to read that attention sink. 
that's basically what's going to happen here. Okay, so so this uh, this slide is basically saying I've found where the attention sink gets created. It does not get created right away from the pink box. It does not get created at layer zero, at layer one, at layer two. At layer three, it gets created. Um, so then the next last thing we're going to do is we're going to look at how does this get used by other tokens. And so the author does three causal experiments where, again, he's interfering with the model to say, can I sort of prove by my experiment that like doing X will affect the model, doing Y won't affect the model. Okay. Um, so one of the things that he is doing is going to have different sentences that are inputs and in a particular place. He's going to use this filter, but instead of deleting the signal, he's going to insert the signal from the other sentence. And so normally this is like pretty, pretty weird if you just take the the the, the floating point values from some completely other sentence and you shove them in the middle of the model. Okay, it can be pretty bad, pretty destructive. Um, but you know people do experiments like this and see interesting thing happen. So if you have one sentence that's John did blah 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 blah, another sentence that's Mary did blah blah blah, and you swap the values, well, you know what exactly happens to the model? Okay. Um, the second experiment he's going to do is is this spectral filtering that we talked about, uh, but he's only going to do it on the first token. So what this is going to do is going to prevent the ability for token zero to write to the dark basis, but otherwise it's going to leave the model completely intact. Um, and then the third thing is this filter we've been doing up till now is, hey, we're going to filter out the bottom 5%, the bottom 10, the bottom 15. What if we just say we're going to filter the bottom 15% except for the last five? We're going to filter the bottom 40% except for the last five. How does that compare to the filter where we filtered out all of the bottom, right? So, so the next slide, slide 31, shows you the results of these three experiments, okay? So the first one where you do the swap thing on the lower left, you see the bright yellow. It's because it's very destructive to just insert values from a completely different sentence. But you'll notice that it gets low at around 50, 60 percent, and there's no sudden jump at the last 5 percent. It's a more gradual phenomenon. OK, so it's destructive, but not in any particularly meaningful way in the middle experiment. When you only filter token zero and nothing else, you have this catastrophic effect where it goes from green to dark blue in exactly the last 5%. And then finally on the right is sort of our reverse experiment. We filter a lot of information, but not the last 5%. And you can see that this chart is not perfect. It's not all dark blue, but it is way, way, way closer to all dark blue. So. You can filter, it's crazy, you can filter out 80% of the information, but as long as that 80 doesn't include the last 5%, the model will actually at least keep producing coherent sentences. So the so this last 5%, this the tension sink is really, really needed for the model to make coherent sentences. Now, don't get me wrong, if you filter out that 80%, it probably can't do math and it probably can't solve like, you know, like, interesting like more complicated things but it'll at least make complete sentences all right so i went a little bit faster on this last part but uh going through the paper but so that's the technical discussion uh slide 32 shows one more chart um and this is uh all the filters we had before the red and the green or whatever we have a new filter the purple line is the one where we filter a whole bunch of stuff but not the last 5%. And you can just see how much lower it is, how much crazy better it is um, than the other ones. And then the second bullet on the lower left, they, uh, I didn't include this, but in the paper, they show you some actual examples of the text generated. And so they say, if we filter out 20%, we get some pretty good completions, 20%, uh, but not the last five. We get some pretty good completions, but any other 20% that you remove, uh, the model will tend to devolve to repetitive things. So it'll say the boy went, the boy went, the boy went, boy went, boy went, boy went. It'll do mistakes like that. Um, and so just a uh, small number, but empirically, you know, it, it seems pretty clear that that um, the last 5% were, were needed in order for it to, 
be able to make complete sentences. All right, question. I'm gonna skip. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so if these, if this last five percent shows little value in the singular value decomposition, why is it so? What? Why is it showing? Why is it being represented as uh, low importance in the singular value de decomposition if it's so important? Yeah, yeah. So the singular value decomposition is of the unembedding matrix. So it's low importance for picking the next token. Mm -hmm. It's high importance for intermediate calculations mm -hmm. used by the model. And so the intermediate calculations are these attention sinks. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay. So when you look at attention, sometimes there's attention on tokens other than zero. Uh, because we're over time, I'm actually going to just um, skip this uh, slide. But uh, they did some experiments and uh, initially had some difficulty figuring out whether or not um, it's because of the similarity between those tokens and the original token. But ultimately, they were able to do some research and said, yes, uh, in this certain way, if it's similar to the beginning of sentence token, then it ends up tending to get a lot of attention later on. So slide 34, the conclusion slide, okay, um, basically... We're looking at the residual stream, looking at the singular value decomposition to try to find what the rotated basis is with respect to predicting the next token, the unembedding matrix. And then normally we look at the biggest part, but in this case, we're not trying to understand next token prediction. We're trying to find what hidden things might be happening that don't affect next token prediction. And so that's where we found this last 5% are really important. And what we see is that layer three okay, is writing this attention sink for token zero, but it minimally affects next token prediction. It's just used for these internal mechanisms. And again, it's used when attention doesn't want to attend to anything. What it does is it attends to token zero. And then token zero, because it has so little sort of value, so to speak, it's like writing uh, minimal information. So this is the part that will be some follow-up information to see exactly what is it writing, how is this working? Okay, that wasn't really included in the paper, but the um, but sort of there is the proof that basically layer three writes a value for token zero and only for token zero. All the tokens after that will look at token zero, and if they don't want to attend to anything else, they'll attend to that one. So layers four and up. So in the attention mechanism, the keys are looking at the attention sink. Um, and only when nothing else matches strongly, then this sort of becomes your default. If I have nothing else to pay attention to, then I'll just pay attention to this, okay? Um, and if it does that, then um, still to be determined exactly what's happening, but then basically the model is writing something uninformative, just some, some quiet, like, white background noise onto the residual stream that ultimately gets ignored by everybody. So that's this paper. Uh, I apologize if I went a little bit fast through things if you didn't uh, follow everything. But um, for me, I just, you know, I do I do uh, love these mechanistic interpretability papers where people are sort of peering under the hood and trying to figure out how things are wired together or whatnot. And so um, this is this is a paper that said, hey, this attention sinks paper found this phenomenon where attention is going to the first token, token zero. How does that happen? And then it, uh, it's a little bit different in different LAMA models, and it's probably going to be different in other models. But for LAMA 13 billion, it's very clear that the attention sink gets created at layer three. Layers zero, one, and two do not use attention sinks. Um, uh, layers four and up, they use the attention sinks. And um, this is where the information is. The information is in those last 5%. It's in those directions. Um, so future work, they may try to narrow down exactly where in that 5%, you know, it's probably not just going to be one direction, but um, it might be a smaller number than, than the full 5%. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so that basically, uh, specifically, it is the keys at layers four and up that are using this uh, attention sink information that's in the last 5%. All right. So uh, we got a late start because of all the weird Zoom screen share stuff. Uh, thanks for, for staying a few minutes past.
Um, I don't have a hard stop, so if people have any other questions, but I understand if people are over time and you guys need to go. So what do they know why it's a layer three? Like, what is the attention sink doing again? Uh, yeah, so the attention sink is the default if you don't want to attend to anything else. So imagine that basically the attention sink says, I'm going to give you a score of one no matter what, okay? Then if you really, if you're like he and you really wanted to attend to John, then you're going to output like a nine. And the nine's going to drown out the one and all the attention is going to be on the word John. Okay, the way softmax works, it does exponentials. So like e to the ninth power is a much bigger number than e to the one first power. Hugely much bigger. Okay, right? So it's going to get like 99% of the attention on, on John. But imagine that you have certain rules for matching things, and you're not on a preposition like he. And so you don't have anything that you care about. So then mm -hmm. you have out, output a bunch of point ones, and you have point one, point one, point one, point one, and then zero's token has this one sitting there, and it ends up getting all the attention. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. it's just that if it's always outputting something like a one, then it's up to you to, to output something bigger than one if you want to actually tend to something else. That's mm -hmm. basically what happens. And so... Um, it's basically this cool no op thing where so if you if you um if you are a, a particular you know attention head and you say i'm going to attend on nouns right if you find a noun you, you output a five you output a 15 and you're good all the attention is going to be there but if you don't find any nouns and you have a bunch of really small values point ones then it's just going to default always to token zero. So any rule, when it doesn't match, it just kind of defaults to token mm -hmm. zero. And then the model needs to learn like what are the right, the correct values to write so that I will ignore whatever got output from token zero. But when I find the thing I do want to find, I find a noun, I find the thing, I find the whatever, then uh, it just needs to write a big enough value when it finds a match so that the, the attention sink doesn't actually have the biggest number anymore. Mm-hmm.